Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Jandric, and I will be moderating the, the, this evening's session. We have a guest speaker here, Juha Suranta from Finland. But first, I will introduce everybody, say a couple of words, and then Juha will proceed with his talk. So, our keynote speaker tonight is Juha Suranta. He is a professor of adult education at the University of Tampere in Finland. He has published extensively in critical pedagogy, public sociology, radical adult and media education. He had numerous uh, academic affiliations, and he has authored and edited an unbelievable number of 35 books. Uh, his recent, recent books include Wiki World, Hidden in Plain Sight, Artistic Research Methodology, Rebellious Research, and C. Wright Mill's Sociological Life. I'm saying this because Yuha has also practiced what he has preached. And in 2009, Yuha has helped a minor asylum seeker in Finland by hiding him to his late grandfather's empty apartment. Yuha's book, uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, based on Yuha's journal, is about his attempt to protect the young Afghan Ashraf Sahil and to help him avoid deportation in inhuman condition. In his book, Yuha states that he could not tolerate the situation where a young person was about to be sent into an uncertain, perhaps life-threatening situation. If it was in my power to do something, I had to do something. Although I didn't know at the time what asylum, deportation, irregular immigration, or the Dublin regulation meant, it was necessary to try to do something, search for help at least. When I found out that there was no organization, including the church, which could help, I realized, realized that I had a duty. Thus, Yuha has hid the youngster to his late grandfather's apartment. And the book can be found on the internet if you just search Yuha Soranta and Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, tonight's talk will be about something different. It will not be about uh, deportation and immigration, but I felt that this little vignette uh, provides a nice introduction to our speaker. Tonight's uh, talk will be about uh, the educational system in Finland and some lessons from Finland, whether we could take some le these lessons and in what kind of direction we should take them in Croatia. So we also have two respondents tonight. The first respondent is uh, Ivana Perica. She is, uh, amongst other things, a critical educator who recently edited an amazing collection of Croatian authors about critical pedagogy, which is, I think, one of the really rare collections of this kind in Croatian language. So I would warmly recommend you to fetch this one from the internet for free as well. And we have Boris Jokic. I don't think that Boris needs a particularly long introduction here. The guy who has been involved very heavily within various media in relation to, and not just media, but also practice in relation to, uh, to the Croatian curricular reform. And so our respondents will after you has talk, our respondents will tell us, I mean, we'll try to see actually what we can do with you has ideas in Croatian context. Thanks a lot. You had the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. And thank you, you too, to be here tonight with me. And thank you to be participating this evening. Uh, I have had wonderful days here in Zagreb. This is my first trip here. And I was involved in, a, in our conference, network learning conference. And this is my second talk now here. So I'm really honored to be here with you tonight. Uh, first of all, I would say something about very general ideas about education as one kind of ideology. Uh, and then I go to more specific to the Finnish schooling model. I would like to ask you whether you are, who of you are te teaching at the moment, at some level? Okay, a couple of you, okay. And uh, that's it, thank you. <laughs> so so the, uh, you others are, are interested in, in general, uh, hopefully about education and, and Finnish schooling system. So. Let me begin by, by a couple of general ideas first. To say that, uh, that uh, education uh, as a field of, of uh, social action is part of every nation state's regime of truth. 
In the 20th century, education has been used as a tool for social and political transformations, change of values, cognitive orientations, and overall organization of, of the population, basically in every corner of the world. It has always been an ideological battleground. Every ruler and government has been interested in education in some ways, for they have known as Marx and Engels put it in their German ideology, and I quote, that the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production. At the moment, the ruling class as has been proved by an analysis utilizing big data, consists of an internal network of approximately 50 mega corporations, just to say it like that. On today's world, educational systems are integral parts of the nation state's system of governance and overall organization of the population. The fundamental question thus is as follows. Who rules the nation state? In the hands of those who are the ruling material force of society, who owns the means of production, a nation state is a useful mechanism to further their economic and political interests, including educational policy. This is happening in many European countries, not to mention the United States. The right-wing politicians are nowadays acting as puppets of the ruling elite and part of them belonging to the economic elite themselves. So it's like political and economic, economical power are collapsing or coming together very tightly at the moment. To add insult to injury, working and middle class are voting the right-wing candidates and even populist parties and forgetting their own class interests. But it must be keep in, keep in mind that ideological effects of the ruling class or whatever class there is do not convey and pass directly like some magic bullets from the sender to the receiver, but through multiple actors and shareholders' communicative actions. In terms of educational acts, no matter the scale and depth of manipulation or indoctrination, there is always that's something which Foucault, Michel Foucault called as productivity of power. It is said that, sorry this joke in between, but it's said that under Stalin, people learned how to read, but they didn't learn from reading what they were reading. Nevertheless, they learned something, but not necessarily what the ruling ideology was expecting them to learn. And this is the general idea of, of education. There's always something which is unintentional in education. And that's what we always call, or sometimes call, freedom. That said, ruling ideology anyway constitutes, con constitutes concrete individuals as subjects. As Althusser, Louis Althusser put it, but at the same time there's always a certain excess or surplus in learning. For example, me. I'm the second generation in Finland who went through the equal meritocratic system and I have to say that I'm indoctrinated by this, 
this idea of, of equality in education. So uh, that system called me as a subject what I am today. In other words, when education is in question, it's not sufficient to name the ruling class and its yes men, but to try to point out the what is called overdetermination of the national educational policy. That is to show how educational policy making and its practical effects are caused by multiple factors and multiple actors. Those actors are in many levels nowadays. There are global actors in educational policy. This is what I called power elite, global power elite. There are think tanks, lob lobbying organizations, trans and international NGOs. EU has his, its own educational policy and so forth. Then there is this national level, political parties, business and industry, the church, the trade unions and so forth. Then there is local, regional level, municipality, school districts, teachers, associations, and school level, principals, teachers, school boards, teacher meetings, and so forth. So there are many levels who are acting and affecting to the national educational framework. I think that as we talk about education and educational reform, it's necessary to remind ourselves of the words of Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault stated that each and every society has its own regime of truth, meaning that those types of discourses which it accepts and makes function as true, and that this this regime of truth is the object under diverse forms of immense diffusion and consumption, circulating through apparatuses of education and information whose extent is relatively broad in the social body, notwithstanding certain strict limitations. And this regime of truth is produced and transmitted under the control, dominant if not exclus exclusively, of a few great political and economic apparatuses, namely university, army, writing, media. But let me now turn from these general uh, notions to describe one specific regime of truth, that of the Finnish educational model, which has been seen as a kind of a counterforce to so-called global educational reform movement that emphasizes competition between schools as in any other markets, standardized learning and testing, test-based accountability, and school choice. Of course, choice meaning relative to one's economic status. The Finnish model is based on six key principles or values, and I, I'm going to present them now. First, there is this principle of local schools which nurture overall growth of the students. Finnish education system consists of, of a one-year pre-primary education, nine-year comprehensive school, post-compulsory general and vocational education. Class teachers teach pupils in the junior classes from one to six, first six years. 
whilst classes 7 to 9, the last three years, are led mainly by specialized subject teachers. Education is free to everyone from the pre-primary pre -primary to higher education and is based on meritocracy, including university entrance exam. In Finland, near or local school principle is followed. Schools do not select students and they mainly enroll in their own neighborhood school. There are neither exclusive girls nor boys schools nor a, nor a significant private school system in Finland. Less than 2% of children go to private schools. 2%. Schools do not compete for students. They don't compete with stu to, for students, but collaborate with each other in order to create a culture of cooperation. Individual school is part of a larger Municip municipal public health and social services. In taking care of the overall growth of a human being, all students receive a free school lunch daily, as well as free health care, transportation, learning materials and counselling. This idea of overall growth is reflected also in school subjects such as home economics, arts and handicraft. Ideally, teachers develop not only head but also heart and hand. The Finnish education system belongs to the cornerstones of the Nordic, Nordic welfare model which provides, for example, free health care and maternity clinics, full paid maternity leave, which is 105 weekdays plus optional 158 days in parental allowance. Unemployment benefits, pensions and quite long vacations, uh, an average of four weeks but uh, teachers have uh, an eight-week summer holiday. This is the first value basis. The second one is public funding, public funding of schools, which also means collective responsibility. The Finnish schooling system is financed almost ex exclusively from public sources, namely by collecting a progressive tax. Based on political decisions of the parliament and city councils, the tax funds are then distributed to the school districts. Schools do not compete with each, with each other for that money. The funds are allocated according to schools' real needs and not by their achievements. And that sort of reminds of, of, of Mark's accord from each according to her ability to each according to her needs. In this same spirit, public funding and distribution of tax money guarantees that every child can have an equal chance to attend school and learn. Finland has succeeded in providing a high, quite high quality education for everyone with reasonable costs. Public spending on education in Finland is close to the OECD average and uh, quite much less than in the, for example, in the United States or Canada. Studies have shown that there doesn't seem to be a positive correlation between educational spending per student and measured outcomes in education. Thus, the efficient use of resources seems to be more important than the level of expenditure, the level of money. 
This is the second value principle. And the third one is, is that schools share common values in Finland. The Finnish comprehensive school was first a quite centralized system. The purpose of centralization was twofold. To carry out large-scale reform in the first place and buffer the oppositional political views from the right. This system was, was uh, established in, in the early 70s. The political decisions for the basic education for all was made in the late 60s. And the school, the system was established in, in 72, uh, from 72 to 1977. The only party which was opposing it was the right wing, of course. But nowadays, they are all behind this schooling system, no matter what the party. It's a kind of a sac sacred cow in Finland, but I don't know how long. Okay, uh, in the 80s, the system was gradually decentralized to increase schools' autonomy in local decision-making. Although state officials still had control over education policy. We have this national curriculum and, and uh, schools and school districts can make their own choices, but only in this national framework. Despite the large autonomy at the school level, Finland will still have this national core curriculum drawn up by the National Board of Education, which is a responsible agency for the development of Finnish education. The National Core, core Curriculum provides a set of common values and basic principles for schools and teachers. And the fourth set of principles this is, I think this is very important, this, this principle, or this idea of, of that teachers are, are trusted in Finland. This is very important. I think I, if I should name one principle out of these six, I would take this one, that teachers are trusted. Teaching is a, and it's based on the fact that teaching is a high status profession in Finland, and teaching belongs to the most popular professions among Finnish young people. Therefore, a large number of high school graduates apply to the university teacher education programs every year, and only 10 to 15 percent of them are selected. It's, it's some, at some years, it's even higher than to the medical school. So that gives you an idea of the, of the sort of status of, of a teacher profession. All teachers in all grades have to hold a university level master's degree. And students graduated from teacher education are therefore qualified and motivated. Perhaps it's the holidays, summer holiday, eight weeks. But it's not the whole explanation, of course. Teachers are respected and trusted. In general, parents are satisfied with, with, the, with the teachers and school conditions. This is like 95% of the parents are very satisfied how their kids are, are learning and, and about their teachers. But we can go back to that. Maybe it's changing a bit, but let's see. Um, and maybe it's different here, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's, let's go to that a little bit later. Um, it's also said that teachers somewhat traditional, authoritarian and collective culture, along with their political and pedagogical conservativeness, has guaranteed the continuum 
of ethical solid teaching in the tur turbulent times of neoliberalism. This is also a very interesting point that our teachers are quite conservative people. But conservative is kind of a new black, if you know what I mean. If you want to be progressive radical, you have to be conservative in these times of neoliberalism. Isn't that interesting? Mm. <laughs> the whole educational system is based on trust. There are neither school inspectors nor officially approved teaching materials in Finland anymore. High quality teachers do not need to be accountable or to report their work to anyone and are permitted to teach autonomously in their own classrooms with the materials and resources of basically their own choosing. As signs of trust in teachers' professionalism, schools in Finland have short school days. Uh, in the first six years, an average school day lasts uh, three to four hours. And in the secondary, I mean the last three years from uh, six to nine, uh, they are then 13 to 15 year olds. It lasts five to six hours. Homework in Finland is minimal <sighs> nowadays and private tuition doesn't virtually exist anymore. Uh, job satisfaction among Finnish teachers is also relatively high and teachers tend to stay in the same profession and working in the same schools. Very long careers. The salary of a teacher is slightly higher than the average in Finland. Median, median salary would be around, this is dollars, but it's around 3,000 euros. I don't know how many kunas it would be. 600. Here in here, yes. 600, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Basic. Basic salary, yes. Then you can reach 700. Okay, okay. Yes. yes, but it's a it's little bit higher than the average in Finland. It's not the salary which explains it, because our you know, you know, living standard is, so our purchasing power must be higher, you know, because the prices are higher too. So, but I, don't, I cannot really compare it. How much is beer? How much is beer in Finland? If you go to the, to the little or store next cornerstone, it's uh, how one half liter costs two euros. How about in a place like this? The cheapest I have seen is, is four euros, but it can be eight euros. Okay, the, the, that is a beer in the index. <laughs> how, how, how much is a Big Mac? <laughs> uh, the, the big, no, no, but Big Mac meal is uh, seven euros with the Coke and fries. I know it because I buy it, buy it to my boys who are 10 and 11 years old. I don't eat McDonald's. It's, I am boycotting it, of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. This is the trust part. And then uh, two, me two uh, another uh, value sets. Uh, the fifth one is, uh, the title is, is uh, terrible. Everyone is special. This sounds like a neoliberal dream, but, but I don't mean this. I mean that one of the basic aims of Finnish school reform was that all students can achieve common educational goals if learning is organized according to each student's characteristics and needs. As a consequence, disabled students are included in general classrooms. And special education is an essential part of the compulsory education. So we don't have uh, special courts for disabled students like we used to have. But it, it's an inclusive system. They are part of the general classrooms. And they can be, they can be helped by special teachers in the classrooms. But they are among other students. 
in Finland, in Finnish special education, prevention is a common strategy. Special education needs are identified as early as possible and anyone can have special education when needed. For example, in 2012, so a couple of years ago, almost one third of all Finnish comprehensive school pupils were in part or full-time special education, mainly because of learning difficulties in reading, writing, <laughs> mathematics or foreign languages. It's believed that the primary reason for educational, educational in inequality is the placing of students in different learning environments which shapes the development of their abilities. The common use of special education in Finnish schools, for example, doesn't add to inequity but reduces it. One particular result of special education worth mentioning is that great repetition is very low and dropping out is almost a non-existent phenomenon. And the last uh, principle is also important. It's that testing in Finnish school is minimal. Another feature uh, is the lack of standardized testing. The only national test is matric matriculation examination for those who continue from the comprehensive to the upper secondary school. 60% of the cohort, that is. Otherwise, assessment, uh, student assessment is an integral part of the individual teacher's work and professional craftsmanship. In the Finnish model of schooling, pupils are assessed and evaluated in terms of their own abilities and achievements and not in relation to their peers. So they are not compared to others, other pupils, but only sort of their own learning path is supported by, the, by their teachers. It's believed that without constant test prep and competition, teachers can concentrate on teaching and education and not uh, uh, on testing. In the absence of national testing, schools and teachers are not forced to compete with each other, but are allowed and nowadays even ob obligate, ob obliged, how do you say this? Obliged to, to work together. What Finland's example shows is that it's possible to have a national education system that is not only humane and democratic in its core, but also effective and com com competitive. Finland's strategy for improving learning for all students can be summed up as follows. First, guarantee equal opportunities for good public education for all. Second, strengthen the professionalism of and trust in teachers. Engage teachers and principals in all central aspects of planning, implementation and evaluation of education, including curriculum, assessment and policy. And fourth, facilitate network-based school improvement, collaboration between schools and non-governmental association and local communities. That said, uh, I have to emphasize that the Finnish schooling model is not without its history. And I would like to maintain that it's the product of progressive polit political era after the Second World War. In the 50s, education was beginning to understood not as an expenditure, but as an investment, both in the state's economic 
and educational policies and in business sector. The left-wing parties and trade unions bought the idea of a broad educational sector as a way to improve workers' welfare and livelihood, as well as their chances to climb up the social ladder. Well, like I said, you know, I was the second generation in that system, indoctrinated by it, but uh, I'm not sure if I was uh, allowed to go to, to school uh, without this system, because my father was an elect uh, the electrician in the Finnish railway uh, company, which was then owned by the state, of course, now it's privatized, certainly. Uh, and my, my mother was working in the, in the department store. So we were a working class family. So I'm not sure if they were willing to put me into school path without this system, this comprehensive system. The 60s was marked by the start of a progressive era in Finland and in other countries too, including the greatest education reform in the history of Finland. The aim of the educational reform was to create a new integrated comprehensive system which would harness every child from every cohort equally into the system. The Finnish parliament accepted the first principal initiative in even uh, that uh, early in the 1963 and three years later, 66, a majority government of the left, left wing and centre party incorporated the school reform into the political agenda. And like I said, it was then established and launched in 1972 through 1977. Well, just to conclude a uh, couple of uh, words, this welfareist, I would say, consensus lasted until the late 80s when the right wing won the elections. That was the first time after, after the 60s. And they started to decrease bureaucracy and increase individual choice in the schooling system. The basic system which I have described has lasted these attacks from the right. But another blow from the right came in 2015, so three years ago, when the right-wing government took the office again. And it has since then cut education budget, not dramatically, but anyway, but hasn't yet touched the basic principles of the, of the Finnish educational model. Whereas some, some researchers in the international uh, discussion have referred to the Finnish schooling system and its success, so to speak, uh, as miracle or mystery. I would like to reserve the characterizations to the unique social totality de developed historically by large governmental and non-governmental coalition, namely the Nordic welfare state, which brought forth such socially just innovation, among others, uh, among other social reforms, as this schooling system. In reflecting on any schooling and educational system or reform, we need to bear in mind that it's always subordinate to the society's political regime and atmosphere and forms only a part of society's totality. As this totality, this political totality changes, the educational system tends to change in the process. The birth of the comprehensive equal schooling was part of the larger political development of the Finnish welfare system 
including legislation that gave ordinary people like me and my parents more freedom and improved their livelihood. These improvements in people's basic living standards established the firm foundation for students' school attendance and they improved school achievements. I, I think there is no school uh, achievements without the solid system of, of you know, health care and, and you know, some sort of future vision that, that we will manage in our families, in our societies, in our you know, life. In order to perform well in school and enjoy learning, it was believed that children need a socially just, safe and democratic society. The well-being of all children could then in turn benefit the whole society. If schools and educational systems at large are seen from the historical point of view, born out of the social and political conditions surrounding and preceding them, then they cannot be treated as commodities that can easily be exported or imported from the nation to nation, like any other commodities. Education as a social fact and real social institution is historically, socially and politically embedded in a given society. This is the reason why I'm rather critical towards all attempts to at least straightforwardly import a schooling system from one country to, to another without proper reflection on the totality of this nation's social and political context. This is how I would like to end my part. And now we could carry on. Thank you, Juha. Um, we agreed to make like a 10 minutes response. Um, I'll try to um, keep it short. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the panel. The panel was planned as. Um, um, the panel was planned um, as a reflection on critical pedagogy today, and I will start. Okay, like this. Okay, good, good. I have to swallow it. Um, the panel was planned uh, as a reflection on critical pedagogy, as I said, and uh, Juha uh, did a lot of research precisely in this area. So uh, I will begin with a small remark on uh, critical pedagogy, then I will draw a rather negative picture of um, the development of European schooling system since the 80s, uh, which is what you were uh, speaking about at the end, and uh, if I will have time enough, I will come back to uh, some remarks um, uh, and lessons from critical pedagogy at the end. So, um, when speaking of uh, critical pedagogy, uh, let me just mention that in 2018, um, it's, not, it's not only 50, 50 years from 1968, but also 50 years since the first edition of uh, Paolo Freire's uh, book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed which proved to be a milestone in the development of critical pedagogy. Uh, however, I don't mention Freire in terms of um, commemoration. I believe there is both spatial and temporal interval between what uh, Juha was speaking about and uh, Freire's own pedagogic ideas. Um, I will um, begin actually with uh, this remark on the welfare state. Um, Finland's welfare state, uh, the post-war uh, welfare phenomenon was not only a Finnish uh, particularity but a widespread European uh, consensus and uh, the systemic changes introduced by the neoliberal agenda uh, since the 1980s deeply affected um, these education systems. While some of the changes are um, certainly better, I, I have to stress this fact that some of the changes are certainly better than the uh, models of schooling which prevailed in previous decades. Um, at the same time, these changes from the, 18, uh, from the 80s on actually led to a gradual alignment of the education system with the market. 
In other words, this trajectory is not to be seen only as a demise of public schooling. I want to stress this ambivalent character of uh, the neoliberal developments. Um, but um, as a proce process that in the wake of new social movements brought along critical thinking in education, the hierarchization of teaching, innovations in teaching and student supervision, democratization of school administration, greater responsiveness of schools to their social environment, curriculum development, school climate development, etc. Um, uh, although all these shifts, of course, uh, can indeed be, be misused, and they often are for commercialization of teaching and learning, the greatest problems occur with the simultaneous transgression of schools uh, into markets. As a side effect, um, the role of student is also being redefined towards human capital, which we uh, experience uh, nowadays as well, and not, for example, social actor or citizen, let's say. Um, according to the European White Paper on Education and Training, um, something, a phenomenon called school development um, has the aim to approximate schools and companies so that the private sector gains a bigger role in the education system. Literally, schools and school managers and uh, in creation strategy for, um, of uh, education, um, um, they, uh, the word uh, is not used or not anymore ravnatel, uh, but rukovoditel. So it's not uh, like old school principal anymore, but it's like school manager. Um, so these school managers should behave as if, sort of, uh, as if they were on the real market. Um, so we speak of uh, market-like conditions or market-like relations, quasi-markets. Uh, In order for their quality uh, to be appropriately controlled and valued, schools must be compared to other market subject, subjects, which requires various um, instruments such as standardization, international rankings and measurements, competition to attract students, etc. Things you were speaking about, but um, in a sense that they are still didn't enter uh, Finland's um, educational system to that um, extent. Speaking of uh, transfer of experiences and good models, uh, I completely agree uh, that the very concept of transfer is a simplified and uh, naive idea. It is precisely due to such uh, naive idealism that the unification of European education systems and harmonization of education policies are united the way they are united. Um, the buzzwords uh, such as uh, lifelong learning, civil education, flexibility, flex security, innovation, mobility, autonomy, entrepreneurship, etc., um, serve mostly as a veil that covers the fact that European educational space functions primarily as knowledge economy, that is, as economy in which, um, as we experience it, Europe is one and, un one and unequal. In other words, uh, transfer of experiences and good models um, Transfer of experiences and good models is futile and uh, counterproductive if we simultaneously treat the student and the teacher merely as abstract individuals without reference to their particular social, economic and educational context, which is also what you said at the end. Um, the very idea of transfer and, transfer and copy-paste methodology does not situate this individual as an economic and social being. It does not take into consideration the structural relations that produce the system of growing inequalities the students are partaking in. Um, and as I said, there is um, an ambivalent trait to all these uh, developments, democratization plus marketization. And um, we, also, we always have to save the good part and eliminate the bad part, which I think is possible uh, if we engage in these processes critically. So, um, you mentioned school um, autonomy and, I don't know, school development also um, in a positive light in terms of um, increasing schools' autonomy in local decision-making, which allows the development of, um, as you said, municipality and school-specific curricula, um, and um, increased participation of teachers in the curriculum design processes, professionalization of teaching practice and academization of teacher education. And I believe this is indeed the crux of the issue. Um, the future of the system depends precisely on how you define school development and all these processes uh, and how you prepare the system for it. Um, let me remind you, contrary to what you said about Finland, that actually uh, you documents, 
Okay. Uh, C school development along the lines set by um, OECD. And um, I don't have to go into detail about OECD, about these um, standardizations and um, output oriented um, um, learning uh, understanding. So um, I will. I will conclude with, as I said, I will conclude with a, again with a remark on critical pedagogy um, and with the quote by Walter Benjamin from, from whom one would not necessarily expect reflections on pedagogy and schooling. Nevertheless, in uh, essays from the end of uh, 1920s, um, program for a proletarian children's theater, and uh, the other is called communist pedagogy, he draws a distinction between education towards something and education from something. Um, and he says the proletarian education needs, um, and we can exchange proletarian education for critical, uh, critical education or critical pedagogy, it needs first and foremost a framework in which it is carried out. This is quite different from the education of the bourgeoisie, where children are educated for something. In other words, we don't need education for something, for entrepreneurship, not even for civil society or sustainable development, if these, are, uh, these notions are understood just like blocks that should be imposed on students. Um, we need to educate on these issues by means of, in Freire's words, problem-posing education where people develop their power to perceive critically the way they exist in the world with which and in which they find themselves, where they come to see the world not as a static reality but as a reality in process, in transformation. As he says, in contrast to the static banking model of education, this is his famous um, expression, it is only this problem-posing education that makes us less human capital and more uh, critical thinkers. That's from my side. Well, thank you. Thank you both on the, on the first very nice talk and then this critical view of, of the talk. I also give in five minutes, just the first kind of uh, response to the talk. Uh, I was at first I was worried about the title of the of the talk because in my view there is uh, almost no one who would be in favor of importing other countries' educational system. If you think from the kind of right wing conservative position, and that would be a no go. You just don't take someone someone else's because of the issues like national pride, etc. From the critical position, it would be also no go. From the rational position, to take out all of the history of uh, context would also be a some, somewhat kind of, I mean, not, not only naive, but it, it would be silly in a way. So I was glad that I, when I read your paper, I was glad that that came only at the end of the, <laughs> as, a, as a last sentence. Uh, there is also one thing preceding that last sentence is saying in a given society, given society, society is a broad term, uh, you're, and obviously here it's being kind of, um, kind of limited to the nation state. Uh, however, if you consider the educational system, and you yourself use the term Nordic welfare, the history of education system is basically not only nation constricted, it has always been an issue of globalization or always issue of sharing. Uh, many nations, many systems of many nations have been under the rule of the other, either colonial or, you know, like monarchistic or, you know, like uh, empire one kind of systems which kind of have put their stake in what we now consider as a system of one nation. Uh, one of such system is Croatia. Croatia is a almost uh, peculiar, beautiful structural mosaic of different influences. One of the influences is clearly Nordic one. If you think, and when you describe the Finnish educational system, the structure of it, it completely mimics what, what was then Yugoslav now is Croatian, Slovenian, Bosnian, Serbian, etc. system. We also have a comprehensive single structure, uh, primary and lower secondary or elementary schooling. Uh, here in Croatia, sadly, it's an eighth year one, uh, for, per, for a good purpose and with a good cause. We also have then, at a secondary level, influences of what 
was Austrian system and what is currently Austrian system. We have an influence from the German and Austrian vocational streams coming at the three year shorter cycles of the vocational education. We have a more continental kind of lycée type gymnasium element at a, also at the secondary level. Uh, as such, considering your paper, uh, the Finnish element of success of structure is here. So we, and, and that's how I perceive creation system, we really do have all elements within the structure of the education system to improve the education for the benefit of both a young person, at first the young person, and then all of the other aspects of what you rightly put, so society which is not, not only education, but also serves, you know, not to go into a Brunerian kind of way of like what education serves all for. So the structure is there, and I agree that if we want to learn from Finland, uh, we can learn from Finland in structure, but Finland can learn in structure from us too. So, because the, the, in a way that the nations, nation system or systems of educational nations are there, is basically, has basically been on sharing the ideas. The second element which you point out and which is really important is the issue of people. People here, by people here, and you rightly put so in your talk, by people you hear think first of teachers or the workers, I call them workers, educational workers. They're not only teachers in schools, in education, there are more, more than teachers, there is professional staff, there are principals, there is also people who are cooks, who are cleaners, they're all part of what's considered educational workers. Here, Croatia, sadly, unlike Finland, from for 27 years now, has not paid enough respect to that, I would say now already marginalized group, societal group, uh, in pure terms of not, not giving enough social status to that group of people. Uh, by not recognizing education as one of its assets, of, of assets, however you want to take a critical, critical view of OECD or, or all other, you know, like knowledge economies and all of the concepts of knowledge, but in terms of like assets of what this nation state can be and should be in 21st century. Uh, the clear view of that is, you put it rightly in your paper, is the way that people are trusting the system and trusting the teachers. And here, and as we spoke earlier, here there is still elements of this trust towards the educational workers. However, it's been deteriorating, and in my view, and I'm putting that for discussion also to everyone, in my view, on purpose and for purpose and by purpose by the, those who are ruling. Uh, in simple ways that education, and like whatever the education entails, as you also rightly put, it entails head, but it also entails heart. Both of these have been purposefully marginalized within this context and this country. So in that respect, we really do have to learn something. But it's not taking the educational reform. It's taking the way that we respect those who work within the educational system, and that what's being given within the educational system. The third element, and I'll, I'll stop here with these, with the critique, of, uh, not the critique, but the, the kind of critical view of, of what you've said, and then I'll con continue just with one minute with something else. The third thing is the issue of equality that you've kind of stressed. Equality in both, as I understood, access, which is basically a school choice, which uh, here we have strongly and fiercely have defended for years, uh, me personally and other people. By, uh, you know, by taking everyone as a, val a person of value, of young people, of persons as of, of value, of mixing people, not mixing by, by, you know, like by, by setup, but allowing people, young people, to have experience of being with someone who is either privileged, not privileged, uh, who is a male or female or whatever, you know, like who is of a religious background or non-religious background. And here, if anything, that, that idea should, have, should be protected and kept. Uh, and I'll finish up, uh, because I know that people will probably have a, an interest in that, in uh, terms of what we here have tried to do, and what we here have tried to kind of encompass in changing the educational system. Uh, and I would say that uh, in terms of educational reform in Croatia, under the name of the comp comprehensive curricular reform, we have tried to intake elements from various nations, various systems, take what's good in each of those, but mainly apply to the system that we have here, and mainly apply to the people that we have here. In doing that, in the processes, we've used the issues of critical pedagogy, both from the Freya, but also from Illich, in trying to incorporate people who are workers to do the change of the education. It was a, a 
it was a very conscious decision by us and by me personally, and it was a decision which I thought was a radical one. Rarely in Europe you do have a, a bottom-up reform which goes from the kind of classrooms anymore. It, these are difficult ones, and they are difficult ones, but also like they are very, you know, like they are, they are sturdy ones, they are stubborn ones. But they they also they are also very kind of irritant to those who are in power, and irritation comes not only on the spectrum of political uh, elites on whatever the spectrum, either right or left. Main kind of idea behind main uh, opponent to that kind of bottom-up approach comes also from the bureaucracy, from the administration itself. The, the idea of institu institu institutionalization of the reforms is basically being kind of pushed by all political parties. The idea that you, you could have a big educational reform, which comes as a democratic kind of process, is something which everyone is opposed to. However, in my view, and the view of my people that I've worked with, my colleagues, that was the only logical way if you want to reach those elements of reaching the hearts and the, both, both heads and the hearts of young people. In doing that, we, we, you need to compromise on all levels. And from the critical perspective, this, this could have been you know, like very much criticized. From OECD perspective or perspective of economy, it could also have been criticized in, in, in many levels. But if you come to the gist of it, if you, if you bring the processes to the people, of the, the process of change to the people, then you have a chance of doing a real reform, the, the one that you've probably done 50 or 60 years ago. And I'll just finish with this. Your, your, one of your quotes is really interesting, and it says, the conservatism is the new black. However, you have to, you have to uh, kind of limit yourself to what kind of conservatism or like what kind of, what kind of idea are these people sticking to? What kind of ideas are they conservative about? Because if you, do, if you have a, a setting, context, in which 27 years you're being marginalized, then you, of course you have a wish to change. And then you, then, you become, then you become kind of emotionally attached to a change. If your change has happened in the 70s, or 80s, or 60s, then you are rightly conservative to the ideas of progressivism. But if, he, if here the new ideas are progressive, then you need to win the hearts and minds of people. Speaking about everything, I like to start from some basic definitions. So I was thinking in, while I was preparing this talk, so what, what is it that we are really talking about here? Are we just presenting the Finnish system? Well, no, we are going to put it into some kind of context. Then we are going to show what happens in Croatia. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you will find a very simple definition of comparative education which consists of four main points. So the first point of uh, comparative education is to describe educational systems, processes, or outcomes. And this is what basically you had it for us today. He really showed uh, systems, processes, and out outcomes of the Finnish educational system. Now the second one is to highlight the relationships between education and society, and even I actually highlighted some relationships between education and society using a Freire or, or I would even say neo maybe, neo maybe Freire in perspective. Then the third point in comparative education, and now it already becomes spooky, is to assist in the development of educational institutions and practices. And this is exactly what Boris was talking about. So I'm just really left with the last point in comparative education, which says to establish general statements about education that are valid in more than one country. And here, I would like to start from uh, my T-shirt. This T-shirt says The Radical Imagination. It's a book that was edited by Peter McLaren and Susie Suhu, you has in mind friends, who are deeply involved with the critical pedagogy movement. And actually, uh, Peter McLaren was one of, uh, I mean, Paulo Freire once said that, uh, he, that McLaren was one of his intellectual brothers and sisters. So basically, it's, uh, I mean, Juha, Peter, I, and some other of us, we really work in this neo Freire perspective. And uh, uh, I was really, when I was dressing up to come to this talk, I opened my wardrobe and I said, hmm, okay, so what will I wear? And I saw the radical imagination. 
So I'm going to start with the radical. Why radical? I think that today, in the age of commodification of education, especially higher education, but not just higher education, in the age of uh, increasing precarity, in the age of uh, what Boris was describing about troubles and problems within creation schools, and some other schools like you had described as well, that we actually do need to be radical. When, I'm say, when I say radical, I don't mean that we should be uh, uh, disrespectful to our past. I don't mean that we should be disruptive, and I don't mean that we should not understand where we are coming from. But being radical here means that it's not enough to change just, for me, that it's not just enough to change uh, 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 some, maybe some systems and procedures, but actually that we need to look all the way back to some primary values. And actually, all, uh, I mean, the majority of you had to talk was about values and principles. So this is the primary, this is the first and the basic thing that I found really important. The second one I found really important is imagine. Because we live in a very different world from what it used to be 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. So taking Paulo Freire, uh, and applying his ideas in the creation context uh, would be counterproductive. What we need to do, we need to reinvent Freire and we need to, need to reinvent other radical ideas. What we need to do is uh, 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 contextualize things to the moment here and now. When I'm speaking about the moment here and now, I'm speaking about the moment of globalization, but I'm also speaking about the moment of a, a, a significant technological challenge that's in front of us, and I'm speaking about the moment of, of, of uh, the current uh, uprise of the right wing, which happens almost, almost in the whole world, not just in Croatia, not just in Europe, not just in America, but practically everywhere else. And the, and the third world, uh, word, and I'll just under describe this one really briefly, is nation. I mean, we have radical imagination. And that, I think, refers very clearly to these ideas that Juha and Ivana and Boris were talking about. That we cannot just take, actually, reforms or any kind form of political measures from one country to another and just uncritically apply. So we need to be radical. We need to be imaginative, and we need to think about our context, which is described by the word nation. Interestingly enough, uh, you and I both contributed to the book, The Radical Imagination, and, and we know that Peter, when he coined this, actually didn't have this talk at all, in, mind, in his mind at all. He was talking about something else. But it's nice, because it shows, let me quote, the fourth uh, the part of the definition of comparative education, generalized, generalized statements about education that are relevant in more than one country. Thank you. Okay, and now we are going to take questions from the audience. So let's. Oh, oh, okay, so you were the first. You were the uh, first, second, third. Let's go. Uh, hello. Um, when I uh, told some of my uh, friends uh, where I'm going today and uh, what uh, is the topic of uh, this, um, uh, can we apply some uh, Finnish ideas on education onto our uh, school system? Uh, they all said, no way. Uh, what I think is, uh, we heard how Finnish system is uh, functioning properly. I, I think so. I, I <coughs> see it like this. And ours isn't. There are, there are many differences. Uh, for example, uh, you said uh, your teachers are um, um, content with their work uh, and uh, pupils and parents are also uh, content uh, with what they are getting. Uh, here we have uh, three groups of frustrated and unhappy people. 
teachers are frustrated, pupils are frustrated, and also parents are frustrated. Uh, and there is no respect here. Uh, teachers do not respect their pupils, parents do not respect uh, teachers, and then also their children do not respect their teachers, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, I'm sure uh, there are many valuable lessons uh, we can take from your example and at least try to uh, implement them here. Uh, there is one more difference. Uh, uh, you have uh, positive selections uh, in uh, educating teachers and here, unfortunately again, we have negative selections. So. Uh, in Finland, only the best uh, uh, students uh, go to uh, teacher professions, and here, uh, not so uh, much. Uh, so, some of the teachers wanted to become teachers, they love their jobs, they are doing b their best. But there are many for whom I can't say this. So it was, it was more a comment than a question, but if you, if you want to <laughs> say something. Well, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, the gentleman at the back is next. Uh, thank you. I just have one question for our Finnish guest here. Um, earlier you stated that uh, teachers in, in Finland are conservative. Now, in this part of Europe, if someone uh, stays for teachers that are conservative, that, that norm normally refers to their, let's say, uh, a stock of uh, anachronistic vir virtues, uh, physical coercion, and similar stuff. Now, is this notion of yours about uh, conservativeness, is it merely opposition to the pivotal uh, neoliberal ideas such as competitiveness, or is there something that, that we can expand on? That's all, thank you. Well, I'm glad that you asked for it because it was partly a joke. But, but there is the truth, like you said, that it's the conservatism is against these ne neoliberal tendencies which were brought up here. And uh, I could almost say that, that in Finland teachers are thinking that if the system is not broken, please don't fix it. You know, so that in that respect, conservatism. But but don't take that as a definition of, of conservatism in any other places. You see, they just want to protect what we have achieved. That's that's their conservatism. Sure, sure. Yes, um, and it is not only a colloquial expression. Uh, also, in uh, pedagogic literature, um, it has some other connotation than in uh, everyday or political uh, political speech, uh, political uh, language. Uh, I mentioned uh, Benjamin and uh, I know that uh, Hannah Arendt was also considered as a conservative in education, but they both explicitly say that when you educate someone, you have to preserve the conditions with a lot, which allow for freedom in edu educating. That, and that's conservative, to preserve the, these, um, uh, the framework where someone can develop freely. Uh, otherwise, you uh, let them off to the market. So they, they both use the term conservative in sense of um, uh, saving, uh, saving uh, the learning person from the encroachments of um, society understood as uh, as market market relations let me let me can i clarify just a little bit to carry on from there you know uh, they are conservative in a sense I, I was just telling you but but many i mean we have quite quite a high quality teacher education and it's progressive. I mean, they develop. I mean, they develop great pedagogy. You know, they sub. They they are substance uh, professionals and so forth. And they develop. They in they in they work when they are work in the working life, teaching people, students. They are still uh, inventing and trying to develop themselves. 
So in that respect, substantially they are not conservative at all. They are very progressive, even radical. They go to the roots. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, uh, have you seen this Michael Moore documentary? The last one, which is called uh, Who to in, in, uh, Invade Next. There's this part of Finland and Finnish schooling system. And Michael Moore, this documentarist, goes to the Finnish school and asks for a, a Finnish math teacher that what's your goal, what's your aim in your math teaching? And this uh, teacher says that my goal is to make my students happy. <laughs> and Michael Moore is, is, but you are a math teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Juha, uh, you can't imagine that uh, Croatian school system is upside down your system. So it's meritocratic, but upside down. Just to give you some uh, illustration, one of our minister of education was one of the worst students at the university. One of the worst. Uh, the majority of uh, ministers of education were uh, from other areas archaeologists, uh, biblarian, doctors, uh, engineers, few and far between were connected with the educational system. So there were political functions and then were executing what politicians wanted. As you mentioned at the beginning, there are different influences at the school, from the local level to the ministry and all the other in between. But they don't have the same influence. There are some which are the main, like the church here. The church has stopped the, the curricular reform from Dr. Jokic. He was fighting as much as he could, but he is just one person. And the church is an institution with thousands of people working for them and a lot of money. So you cannot beat them. So imagine, in the uh, book of catechism, it's written that uh, atheists are the culprit for Auschwitz. Could you imagine something like that in Finland? We have a discrimination at school and uh, pupils are thought to hate everybody else who is not Croatian and Catholic. Doesn't matter who. And that is in the uh, catechism, uh, in, in the official school, uh, excuse me, a book of catechism, because the ministry cannot change a word. The church has the absolute autonomy to put in their books whatever they want. So imagine that you have this system in Finland, how could your school system be? What kind of result would you have? What kind of happiness would you have in your school among teachers, among pupils, and among families? And then you wouldn't be the first, the best uh, school system in the world for years, and that's why you are here, because we are all impressed with your system and your results, which are objective. It's not something which is invented. And we know that it's true. And we, in Croatia, simply don't use the human capital of our pupils. We don't teach them to think, not to critically. Think whatever. So if you, if you are not able to think, you cannot think critically. And this imagination, which is written, radical imagination, comes from a lot of ideas. So if you have in your head, in your memory, a lot of ideas coming from different areas of knowledge, then somebody, something, uh, we, we will start thinking, we will start realizing things and wanting to change the situation, like Dr. Jokic, of course, he, he is one of the leaders here. But you cannot change the system when the church is above everything. Thank you. Uh, sorry for, for my long. I'm, 
I mean, I, there is a lot of truth in what's being said. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, uh, you know, like who, who, who obstructed. As I said, like there were, when you have a progressive ideas, there is everyone against them, and they take time. As as your as your uh, case also shows, it almost kind of you you need time for these ideas to be pushed. So you you cannot expect that they'll go without any trouble. And there is a, from various sides there is an ob obstacle to progressive ideas. Uh, that that that's the fact. I just want to add one thing to the pre, to the discussion here is basically um, if we believe the uh, PISA results, which I do, uh, and if we, if we believe them over the time, which I also do, there is a PISA does OECD does collect all other kind of information within this testing. One of the uh, information that it collects is the index of happiness of pupils. Croatia is the fourth. The kids are happy in school. So, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I know it, it sounds, there, there are several other countries which are better than us. One is Mexico. <laughs> okay. The other one is Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a very interesting country regarding the, the education, so like in terms of comparative education. And I think the, the other one is Netherlands. Uh, the, one of, and, and also when you speak, when you, when you do research in Croatia, the, the kids tend to be okay with school, which I see positive. They particularly, what I see positive is particular that still the relationship between teachers and pupils is at a higher level than in other countries. So the creation system has its own kind of, I mean, good sides to it. And, you know, like, if there was an investment, but not just financial investment, you know, if there was investment from all sides to devote to that, and you're completely right in what you've said about, you know, like how, how can you do it here when there is, everyone is against you, and especially, like, powerful structures and organizations. But if there was a kind of clear commitment of the society to, towards education, then I think, as I said before, I think that there are pillars there that could really, you know, like, that could make this system much, much, much better and, and to the benefit of people. But also just to, to add to, like, the, there's this, and of course it comes out from, you know, like various perspectives, especially if you come from the perspective of critical pedagogy or if, you, if you're really extreme in your thinking about education and pedagogy. There's always a schism between, you know, like the, what the market or economy forces and what you, how you see a person as a human and, you know, like as a kind of de develop, and in terms of development of a, person and natural development of the person. However, I feel that in, in today's world, especially in a westernized world, that's, that schism is kind of becoming less and less obvious. You would have, like you mentioned, like you would have corporations who would clearly kind of emphasize the role of critical thinking, who would clearly, clearly emphasize the role of problem solving. And, and that's kind of, it's a in, very interesting kind of development. It comes from the idea that the world has become globalized and the ideas of the class has changed. The, the world should, should be seen as a kind of class structure. So, you know, like a lot of jobs that were there before in Croatia or Sweden, like the mention of your history, like you said, are now somewhere else in Sri Lanka, in Vietnam, etc. But we are left as a kind of now here white Europeans, you know, <laughs> we are left here with a totally different set of problems. And that, that kind of, that sets out the to total different view of a human. And that view of human is paradoxically closer to the ideas of critical pedagogy than ever before. And it is a really interesting kind of, you know, like theoretical points to, to, to be seen, you know, like you, if you see the, the conceptualization of Microsoft, Google, etc., of how they see 21st century, whatever, how they call it, skills or aptitudes, they're, very, you know, they're much closer to the idea of, you know, like Illich or, you know, like than, than ever before. <coughs> Uh, I, sorry. May I reply to that? Sorry. Yeah, I totally agree. That that's why I was speaking about the ambivalence of these processes, and I think we should then distinguish between two levels. Uh, Pedagogy did reform. You know, you you you're completely right uh, on the level of um, um, development, uh, even of curriculum, where where people fight over issues like contents of education. Yeah. Uh, much progress has been done, and also teacher-student relations. Uh, it is sort of realized the the aims of critical pedagogy on many levels. The other thing is the, the uh, system development, which is commercialized, and I think at certain point these uh, you know. Um, uh, um, competition and uh, always thinking what, how, how, which achievement we will have at uh, next PISA uh, testing, or um, do we uh, comply with the regulations? Will the state give us money? Have, do we have to make commercials in the schools? Or don't we don't have enough money, so we have to rent our 
our rooms, etc. Um, at certain point, uh, also the competition that arises between teachers. These are the trends. Uh, uh, this tends to um, have bad impact in the end of all these good developments which um, have been uh, achieved. Yeah. So these are two. two okay. Levels. Can you just can you just jump in for a moment with the with the comment which is uh, I. Though I think that there is a, here some kind of misunderstanding of the ideas and the role of uh, critical pedagogy. What did happen with 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 the with the uh, corporations and with the, all the large systems that they took the lingo of critical pedagogy. They took the idea that we should be critical, but it actually appropriated it for the pur for the purpose of capitalism. As opposed to that, critical pedagogy is an emancipatory project which is completely contrary to the capitalism. It's a revolutionary project which is against the capitalist modes of production. It's against the uh, capitalist modes of understanding what human beings are. And actually, uh, seeing the message, I mean, capitalism took from critical pedagogy what it needed, but just ignored the rest. And actually, in the process, it distorted it so much that I would deeply disagree with the idea that companies such as Microsoft are promoting values by people such as Ivan Illich. Because it's just, it's just a very different, I mean, it's completely opposed. It's, it's completely opposed social forces in place here. And just, just a brief reply to your church thing. Uh, I completely agree with you about the role of the church in Croatia but it's not the only church in the world. And there, are, there is Catholic church, for instance, in South America, and the strong tradition of liberation theology, which is very much opposed to it. And actually, the current pope very much arrives from this type of tradition. So it's even, we should not even take a look at the church as a monolithic thing. But going back to this, going back to the relationship between critical pedagogy and capitalism, like many other things, critical pedagogy has been appropriated by capitalism. But in the process, it was destroyed. And that's why it needs to be reinvented for the position, for the moment here and now. No, no, I, I, I agree with that. I just said that probably at this point, the nexus of closeness is larger than ever, ever before, you know. And there is, a, of course, a, once again, like use of the capitalism uses that, of course, for its own purposes. So I'm not saying that, you know, like it, these are the same ideas. It's, it's clear in my head that they're not. It's just interesting how these processes are being, as you said, like being taken over or like modified, etc. Either, either linguistically, you know, like other, or, or semantically, or you know, like in any other sense. However, you know, like there, it's an interesting how the economic interest now has the interest to take them over. That's really something to think about. And just, just shortly, and I don't want to take, take from the discussion, uh, you know, like, you're, you're right about you know, like how these, these things are you know, like being, uh, at one point, some, things, some progress has been made, and at the other point, there's, there has been tendencies which are horri horrifying. You know, like, as you said, you know, like, too much testing and standardized testing like, affects the workers' pay. You know, like nowadays, you have the states, some states in the United States, where according to the tests, you know, like the teachers are being teachers' salary are being formed according to the test. Uh, there are tendencies in Croatia without, without any thinking of taking that over, you know. And it's, it's up to the educationalists of all sorts and all around the spectrum, from the right wing to the left wing, you know, like, but who feel education as such, you know, like to, to kind of resist these tendencies and to come up with solutions and like policies which would kind of buffer them and give the autonomy. And as you said before, like, you know, like it's especially with, with the assessment to allow the professionalism of teachers to, to kind of use that autonomy and use the professional judgment. And one more thing, like you, you also mentioned the, mentioned the idea of the ipsative assessment, of the assessment of the person according to the person's kind of development, coming back to the psychological theories of Vygotsky, of the zones of the development, etc. That, to push that in the schools here, like that, that would be really beneficial to the, you know, like all spheres of, of development of society. We have a question from the audience, which has been waiting for like 20 minutes, yeah, thank poor you. guy. So. Please, so, go ahead. Thank you for your wonderful um, uh, lecture here. Uh, I have uh, two questions which are very concrete, but, but before I ask the questions, I would like to say something in favor of Croatian educational system. I'm not a teacher, so maybe the things have changed in the last 20 or 25 years since I haven't been in an elementary school. But uh, my personal experience with the Croatian uh, system as a student was uh, very good, and I think that 
20 or 25 years ago, all of these principles that you named for the Finnish educational systems would be quite normal here. For example, I uh, spent uh, some time in a high school in Sweden, and when I came there, I didn't see any big difference, for example, in the attitude of the teachers and, um, and the way how they approach the students and so on. Uh, and for example, I always remember one of my uh, teachers, it was uh, in the university, uh, who once said that uh, he was at the time 60 years old and he said, uh, when I became a teacher, we were taught uh, that uh, the aim of the good teacher is to make a good student of everyone and not to make students to drop from the process. So I think that uh, most of these uh, uh, most of these things uh, would, uh, can be undersigned by most of the Croatian teacher, probably even today. But uh, my two questions uh, is, uh, the first one, uh, do you have uh, minority schools in uh, Finland? So I don't know what are all the ethnic minorities recognized in Finland, but I guess that uh, Swedes are probably one of the minorities, maybe some is the Laponian population in the north. So for example, if I were Swedish and born in Finland, would I go to say a Swedish school so that most of my colleagues are Swedish? Or I would go to a Finnish school and if I go to a Finnish school, would I be able to, for example, choose uh, more Swedish and to choose uh, Swedish history uh, instead of Finnish history to learn? or we would all uh, uh, learn more or less the same subjects. And my second question is about uh, the vouchers in schools, uh, because I think that this is probably something that, we, that is expecting us here in the near future. So for example, um, in uh, Sweden, as you probably know, in the beginning of the 1990s, the voucher system was introduced. Now more than 10% of the Swedish uh, pupils are in the private schools. And you said that it's uh, less than 2% in Finland. So I guess that you still don't have uh, such a system. So what are your thoughts on, uh, of, on such a uh, system? And are there, uh, for example, uh, movements and uh, parties who argue for uh, this in uh, Finland? Okay, and, thank you. And I would like also to hear uh, the thoughts of uh, of uh, Boris Jokic on this for, for Croatia. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. The trouble is that we have uh, four more questions and 15 more minutes. So we'll ju just take two people at a time and then we'll try to like uh, optimize our time. So please just give yours and then we will answer to yours and then we will take two more and then we will ask answer to two more. Okay. Thank you for what. Uh, actually, I just have a short reply to Mr. here who was uh, preoccupied with the significant role of uh, a Catholic Church in Croatia. Uh, yes, we have to be extremely vigilant about the re religious interference in, uh, in, in the public sphere, but I think we have also another problem. And I'm not referring uh, only to Croatia, but this part of the world. After 70 years, we, we are still, every peasant has to have uh, an opinion about who was the partisan, who was the, uh, who was the side of Yugoslavia, who was the Ustasha, who was the Chetnik, and who was the Dombra. If the Scandinavian nation would be preoccupied with such a question, who was squeezing or not, they would be in the approximately similar shithole than, than we saw. I think that uh, first, uh, if we want to change something, first, first we have to stop, to stop lingering in the past and to move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Juha. So, to your questions. Uh, uh, we are a bilingual country. So we have Finnish and Swedish as an official language, is plus Sami. But it's not official, it's semi-official. But anyway, uh, the national curriculum is the same, but it contains uh, different parts for different languages. So that if you are, if you are living in a Swedish-speaking area in Finland, you go to the school where Swedish is the language of learning and teaching. You know? But they, who are Swedish speakers, they have Finnish lessons, so they learn Finnish 
and, uh, and, and the majority, meaning the Finnish-speaking students, they learn Swedish as their second language. But the curriculum is the same. Of course, these regional, you know, interpretations and, and freedoms and so forth, they, they uh, apply. But we are very monolithic culture. I mean, we, our minorities are very few. I mean, we have Swedish-speaking Finns, and then we have Russian people. But in our legislation, there is this um, regulation that every minority can have and must have uh, teaching in their own mother language. So if, if a Kurdish people come, they have a Kurdish uh, teaching, you know, two hours a week or so. And then about these vouchers, uh, the debate between Sweden, Swedish system and Finnish system is going on at the moment. My wife is a trade unionist and, and she is at the moment in our capital just, you know, working out these questions. And we are hearing from Sweden terrifying news how they are ruining their system with these vouchers and privatizing the system. And teachers are not happy. There's a lack of teachers in Sweden nowadays. Uh, people, are, students are not happy. And, and the, the, the system is, is corrupted inside. And we, that's a warning sign for us not to follow that path. We are absolutely against the Swedish model. Boris, quickly. Yeah, well, so see now, you're not, you're not importing reforms then. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> <laughs> you have to know them before you import them or not. Uh, j just quick, quick uh, I, I agree with your uh, kind of, um, how you see the current state of the creation schools. You saw that I also see positive and optimism within the system. Second thing is uh, uh, regarding the minority, I'm, I'm not gonna speak much about that. I'm, I'm, for the, I'm for the minority education in terms of that they should have rights for that. I'm co completely against two schools under one roof in terms of like segregating people. I'm, I'm just, that's, that's, that's just, you know, I'm, I'm very much opposed to that in Croatia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think that that's a really poor model which just, just, con yeah, I mean, it serves the segregation of people. But I, I would allow minorities to have education at whatever level in their language and about culture. Regarding the vouchers and the voucherization, I do not think that there will be voucherization of Croatian elementary and secondary education. The sector is even smaller than in Finland. We really do not have almost any uh, private uh, elementary schools. Uh, in Zagreb there is one or two, and maybe maybe in a la few larger cities one or two. So at elementary and elementary level there is none. There are, however, religious schools, and they are, but they are also state finance, financed. There is also another interesting movement: is basically uh, state financed schools of groups of parents, which are be being hit by the religious organizations again, which has gone completely under the radar in Croatia. No one knows, like, just because people do not follow education. There is a potential for voucherization in the tertiary education. However, the private sector there has not expanded its uh, profile of its studies. So it would be only in two, two fields of science, which would be the law and economy. And it would be really irrational and hardly defendable uh, on the position of the government and the authority to allow the voucherization only in these two fields of study, uh, especially because these two fields of study are the largest as such. So really either the private sector expands to, you, to offer biomed, biotech, uh, natural sciences, universities, etc. then there is a foundation to discuss the voucherization. But at the current state, I do not think that, that that's possible in Croatia. Thank you very much. We have uh, two more questions. The first one is in the back. And, okay, and the third comment, yeah. So, but we'll, we're gonna need to take them really quickly. Uh, please yeah, go sure. ahead. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Okay, we, we hear each other. No, so. we're recording, you must speak. So, I wanted to ask you, um, you heard most of our problems with uh, teaching and with politics, which is quite involved in this uh, education, education thing. And uh, I would like to hear your advice, how you see it from outside, 
and uh, what would be your advice to us how to change it and how to bring those changes into Croatian schools because European Union says that we have a good product this um, uh, this uh, curriculum reform that uh, Boris Jokic and his team made. So how to bring it to the schools and how to push it inside. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question and one comment before we answer, because we are approaching the end of the session. Here in the first row, please. My question is simple. Uh, can or should educational reforms be depoliticized? I mean, having in mind two things. We live in uh, societies which are becoming uh, economically much more unequal. And second, political polarization across the spectrum seems to be increasing. So it seems sometimes that, that there is a choice between toothless reforms which will add up some ICT skills and maybe end up in some kind of marketized concept and something which will be politically meaningful, more comprehensive, but then it will bump into roadblocks and, and, and end up nowhere. And second, which uh, question is, uh, what happened in Croatia with the legacy of a Roman Catholic priest of Croatian origin, uh, Ivan Ilic? You mentioned him three times, and this is, I think, the most I've heard in decades. <laughs> and his book, The Schooling Society, was translated, I think, one or two years after it was published in the West. Uh, it was published, uh, I think it was, it, it was translated in Serbian, but that's, that's irrelevant for Dole the it, 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 Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it had a good reception in Croatia as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll just take the comment and then we'll start answering. Thank you. Uh, the European Union has a day of 9th May. The 9th of May was the day of capitulation of Germany and all the allies of Germany. So, we, in Europe, it's very clear who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. The bad guys are fascists, the good guys are anti-fascists. Anti-fascists are partisan. Ustasha are fascists. And that's clear in whole Europe except in Croatia and the church. Catholic Church in Croatia especially, who likes especially war criminals. And that's the whole difference between the Croat Catholic Church and the South American Catholic Church and the South American theology of liberation. If I were in South America, I would <laughs> prize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just invite you had to reply to these two things. To, uh, actually, four, two people, four questions. Well, unfortunately, I don't know t t so well of your system, so uh, it's, it's in, it's in, um, I cannot really say any advice, but I would just point out that, that teacher education at the university levels is, is one of the core ideas, was in Finland to sort of, you know, to improve the, the status of teachers, so if I would say, if I were to say something, I would say that that you should resource high-quality teacher education and get the good students students into the profession. Thank you. Yeah, and the, 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 your question is, I mean, spot on. Uh, you know, like I don't think that any any reform could be depoliticized. I mean, the education is a political issue. That's clear. However, there is a, you know, like there is a role that ex executive politics should play. Executive politics sh should not interfere into teaching method because it doesn't know anything about it. It should not interfere what is being taught in musical, in music, nor in biology, nor in, you know, like, nor in uh, mathematics. The politicians do not have any kind of authority to go into the expert or professional issues of what is being taught or how it's being taught. They have a role in making decisions. So that, that I mean, there's a, in my view, there's a clear delineation of these two elements. They, will, they are elected to govern, they are elected to make decisions, they're elected and they will be either elected or not elected in the following elections. Uh, to, so that, that's the, you know, like it, it is always politicized, However, the, you know, like the body of knowledge, the body of scientific knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, psychological knowledge is there. So the reforms are founded on some evidence and reforms are founded on knowledge and skills which are 
proven to work. You know, to come to to your issue of in in today's world, the Finland. The, the, this is a great example. Finland has done reforms from the 60s on. Croatia has not done them. Croatia has not done them in the 90s when, for example, Slovenia has done them. The question, the real question is, is 2018, in 2018, in today's world, is it possible at all to do reform, a comprehensive reform? Because, exactly because of the issues that you mentioned. On one side, you have benefits of like ICT, digital, digital technologies, the work is much quicker, the interaction cooperation are, is, is much stronger than in 60s or 70s. On the other hand, you have polarized, even bigger polarization than ever before. So the, the key question there for me is, is this nation, uh, I mean, sound enough and solid enough? Are the elites solid enough to say, and that, that was my, you know, like my statement from, for years now, are they solid enough to say, okay, like we, we, we have a window of 10 years, because that's, that's my, how much you need, exactly. You have, we have a window of 10 years and we'll, we'll sustain political bickering and daily politics in these 10 years to stay on a track. Thus far, the Croatian politics has proven that it's not capable of doing that. Thus far, it's proven that it's, you know, like it's being led by the you know, like very, very crude, very, very kind of raw interests. And that's how, why you have this like small, not even reforms, you have small kind of ameliorations or nothing about reform. And the ideas, although we, were, we are not perfect in our thinking nor, nor processes, the ideas, the fundamental ideas that we've proposed are being opposed. Exactly for that reason. They do not have the wisdom, nor do they have a patience to sustain a 10 year period of change, investing in 40 years later. Thank you very much. I would like to give Ivan Aperitz a word to give us uh, our final, final words, final conclusion before it's, we thank you. Huh? It's actually more a joke, but it's also a reply to your question. Um, I mean, uh, if you read this curriculum, uh, it's highly apolitical, actually. I mean, it's objective and it's based on um, uh, scientific grounds and it ha contains no propaganda. But even this neutral um, yeah, middle of the road, of the road uh, was politicized. And I'll just say two words I uh, found uh, in the comments and uh, also in conversation with the teacher how it gets politicized. It was accused of um, uh, humanist psychologies, psychology, so there is too much influence of humanistic psychology in this um, uh, in this curriculum, and the, this is a completely bad thing. And the other thing I heard from a teacher uh, is that it represents Yugoslav internationalism <laughs> uh, because it contains too much foreign languages, and that makes people even easier to emigrate and to uh, accommodate in new in new countries. So, um, I mean, how substantial is that? <laughs> Just because it's being taped, it's because, because it's being taped, you know, like, and people, people like to dig various stuff, that these are not the only criticisms. Uh, you know, there are criticisms, for example, like I've been, uh, and we have been criticized for being the, the you know, like the puppets of, uh, of uh, economy. So the, the puppets of the big, big, big players in economy. Uh, I've been called, I've been, I'm neoliberals, yeah, I've been, I've been called Shuvar, you know, like those of Croatian. So like there, there have been various, you know, like even, even, even if you put it kind of, try to put it objective and consensual, there's going to be attacks from all sides. So these are, but these are good ones. I, I particularly like because it's too humanistic. I like that. Speaking about the roads, I think that we should conclude with the, with the old Zapatista saying, Boris was looking for a middle road, Juha is looking for a Finnish road, Ivan and I are doing extreme road, but we all make the road by walking. Juha, thanks a lot for coming to Croatia.